Good evening, good afternoon and good morning everyone across the world. Um, sorry we're a bit late on, on this program. Um, thank you so much for your patience if you've been here from, from the hour on the dot. Um, so a very warm welcome to the ADEX Pixel Virtual Expo. Um, we're hosting this in collaboration with the Blue Hope campaign by the British High Commission, um, which is a, an online campaign to raise awareness of the importance of the world's oceans, how plastic pollution is damaging ocean biodiversity and to encourage action in tackling marine pollution. So today we're delighted to have with us Howard and Michelle Hall. Hi Howard, hi Michelle. Hello. Hello. Hey. Um, Howard and Michelle are best known for their underwater IMAX films. So uh, they're both highly acclaimed. One of the uh, of the five highest grossing 3D films produced by IMAX, two were directed by Howard, and between them, Howard and Michelle have seven Emmy Awards. So it's a great honor to have you both here today um, to share with us. Uh, so today, the session that they'll be running is titled Underwater Images from the Giant Screen. So they'll be sharing with us, um, you know, uh, techniques and, and their, their experience with um, making 3D movies for IMAX. Um, enough from me. Uh, Howard, Michelle, over to you, please. Well, good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Amelia. Yep. Uh, Hello, everybody. We're so pleased that ADEX wanted to uh, have us participate in your World Ocean Week uh, presentations. So thank you so much for that. Um, as Amelia said, we're going to talk with you today about how we've captured images for the giant screen and for IMAX over the years. We're going to be showing you both still images and some video. Um, in the world of Zoom, some of the video may or may be a little bit jerky. We hope not. We hope it'll be okay, but bear with us uh, if that happens. Um, so Howard's going to share his screen here as we deal with the technology. Stand by and off you go, Howard. With Tell a us luck. about there the we go. video and the stills, and don't forget to give credit for who took a lot of the stills. Uh, well, <laughs> let's let's get that out of the way first. There's a lot of still images in this presentation, and Michelle took most of these. And if I hadn't said that, I'd be in real trouble later on. <laughs> well, since he's going to be doing most of the talking, I just wanted to get my foot in the door with uh, with my participation here. So, is that so look okay here over we there? go. Okay, so. Um, I've made, uh, we, Michelle and I have made a number of television films early in our career. And uh, uh, the first film that we made was a film called Seasons of the Sea, which uh, ADEX is gonna be showing right after our presentation. If you wanna hang around for an extra uh, 52 minutes and, and watch it. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting time now because we're in the middle of a real revolution in image technology. And many of you have noticed we've gone from, from standard definition to HD definition to 4K and now even 8K. And the, the televisions that you can buy at, uh, to put in your home have gotten bigger and bigger and higher resolution. And that has real interesting consequences for those of us that make, make films. So uh, after we made our, our television films, we did a number of those we started making IMAX movies. And uh, uh, that's been a very interesting experience. And, and uh, we've uh, had a great time making these films. And it's interesting how the technology has changed. And uh, IMAX films uh, were very difficult to make. Uh, when we shot these films, we shot them in, in 70 millimeter. This is an IMAX screen, just so you know what IMAX is. Uh, IMAX is the largest screen format in the world. Uh, the IMAX screen can be uh, 25 meters high and uh, uh, and do the conversion and over <laughs> about 30 meters uh, across. So it's a it's a huge screen. And if you look at this image, you can see the, the, the chairs are very close to the screen. You're right down there next to it. And so in order for that not to appear fuzzy, because, you know, as you sit close to a, a big screen, images tend to get fuzzier, uh, less sharp, the closer you sit to them. Uh, the image on, in IMAX has to be extremely sharp. So 
the way these images were captured was by using a, a very, very large film format. Uh, our television films, including Seasons of the Sea uh, and many of the other films we made early in our career were captured in 16 millimeter. And when you look at this image, you can see that uh, 16 millimeters represented by the frame on the upper left. It's a, a tiny little bit of film. Uh, and it was fine for television at the time. Television at the time was standard definition. And uh, uh, it was about uh, four, 480 lines of resolution top to bottom. And um, uh, it, you showed it on a, a small television set, which was almost square. And you sat relatively far away from it. And because the image was you know, not technically very good to begin with, and because the screen was small, you could get away with a lot of really bad camera work, which I did in my early career, actually. Uh, at the time, feature films were captured in 35 millimeter film, uh, which is, you know, all the, the normal, you know, dram dramatic features that you see at the theater were captured in, set in 35. But IMAX was captured in a format that was much, much bigger. This is a, an IMAX frame at the bottom. Uh, it's an enormously big piece of film. And when you project it on the IMAX screen, it stays relatively sharp because it, there's so much visual information captured on the film. Uh, but in order to capture images in 70 millimeter, we had to use big machines. And this is the underwater IMAX 2D camera. Uh, this is the film we made Island of the Sharks with and, and several other films. Uh, it was a, a big heavy box, the camera, system weighs about 100 kilos and uh, uh, you would load it with a roll of 70 millimeter film. That's what a roll of 70 millimeter IMAX film looks like. And uh, that roll of film weighs 10 pounds just itself. And uh, the good news is that it would run for three minutes before you had to change film, which is not a very practical way to do wildlife work. Uh, and it was very expensive. The, the film, a roll of film like that cost about $1,000 to purchase. It cost another $1,000 to process. And then in order to transfer it to, to video so you could edit it, uh, you would print it down to 35 millimeter, transfer it to video, and that cost another uh, $2,000. So you ended up spending between $3,500 and $4,000 every time you shot three minutes. Uh, this is a shot of the IMAX 3D camera, and 3D added an enormous amount of, of complication to making IMAX movies. The 3D camera was a huge machine. Um, it was valued at over two and a half million dollars when it was when, when it was bought um, built by IMAX. IMAX built four of them, and uh, the trick was to run two rolls of 70 millimeter film through the machine simultaneously, each behind its own respective eye or lens and capture the image in 3D and then project that image on the IMAX screen in 3D. So you don't see that, do you? No, I was trying to point yeah. to the lens, but um, I'm that, looking at this presentation and I, you can't see the cursor move. So, so with a camera system that weighs 1300 pounds, you can't just <laughs> hand, use your hand and muscle and lower it over the side. How, how many kilos is that? Uh, about 600 kilos. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. So we would need to hire boats that had cranes on them or uh, arrange for the boat to have a crane installed. In this case, we're in British Columbia here and we were fortunate to find this fabulous boat to work off of uh, that already had a crane on board. And you can see the camera dangling there carefully with ropes, people holding ropes to so it doesn't swing around. We've had problems with that in the past. Um, uh, but we're lowering the camera into the water and here it's just been lowered to the surface. Our divers are on the surface ready to accept it. Um, our team of divers that we call our launch and recovery team are there to take the camera down to Howard and his dive team. Uh, there would be four of them on rebreathers. Um, ready to start filming. So, so those of you that take underwater photographs know that carrying a camera around underwater adds a lot of drag to, to swimming and complexity. Using a, a camera system like this was just ridiculous. Uh, it's 
It's the most impractical format for capturing underwater wildlife ever invented. And, uh, uh, and again, that, that huge system only ran for three minutes before we had to send it back to the surface and have the film changed. And the process of changing film took about a half an hour. So capturing wildlife behavior with a, a camera like this was extremely challenging. Uh, the advantage was that everybody's expectations were very low. Nobody expected us to be able to really do very much with the camera. And if we were able to capture a starfish in 3D, uh, you know, everybody was thrilled. So anything that we did was kind of a positive with this camera. It was, it was extremely difficult to use, but for me and the divers that, that were part of our crew, uh, that challenge was fun. I mean, I really loved using this camera. I loved it because it was so difficult. It was almost impossible to do stuff with it. And so every, every minor victory was a, it was a big deal. And when we failed to capture something because the animal moved too fast or any number of reasons, or we simply ran out of film before anything happened, nobody was ever surprised. <laughs> uh, this is uh, in North Carolina. And just, I love this photo of uh, Howard in his rebreather and his dry suit and the big camera and just showing the proximity of the size of the camera system to the size of a diver. So it's not something you just swim around with. And a lot of people often ask, you know, do we, you know, do we have a plan when we go underwater? Uh, when we're making an IMAX movie, especially with a, a 3D camera, when we go underwater with a camera, we have a very specific shot that we're, we're after. And because the, the camera only runs for three minutes, uh, that really translates to about five different shots that we can capture on one, one dive. So we would go down and have a very specific idea of what we were going to shoot, and we would spend a lot of time preparing and setting up for that shot. So the, there was nothing cavalier about it. We would, we would uh, you know, have a very detailed plan every time we went in the water. And really, my, my worst nightmare is to being in a situation where I'm out making a film and I'm diving, looking for things to shoot. Uh, that really never happens. When I'm underwater with a camera like this, I know exactly what I'm looking for. And uh, uh, we have very specific goals in mind. And we're back in British Columbia here just with the beautiful, beautiful colors of the, uh, um, I was gonna say plumeria, that's not right. <laughs> Plumos anemones. Plumos anemones. <laughs> Plumeria are flowers we have on our deck outside. Um, so obviously you can see that we're using rebreathers here. Uh, we're using full face masks. Uh, because the camera is, is such a complicated system and, and difficult to use, uh, the amount of time we were able to stay underwater was really important. So rebreathers allowed us to stay underwater until we got the job done. We didn't have to worry about running out of air, um, and you know, running out of air when you, you're handling a camera this big would be, you know, a real a catastrophic <laughs> problem. So uh, we typically had two teams of divers: one diver that uh, one set of divers that had rebreathers. There was usually four of us down on the bottom with the camera system, and then we had a launch and recovery crew. Uh, while we were underwater, we were accumulating decompression time. And instead of swimming the camera back to the boat after every three minutes, we would just get on our underwater communication system, uh, which ocean technology systems developed for us. Uh, we get on the comm system and call the surface and request uh, the launch and recovery crew to come and get the camera. And of course, when Howard says every three minutes, he means three minutes of film, which could take an hour, hour and a half, two hours to, uh, to actually shoot by the time. He would get down in the water, scope out exactly where he wanted to film. The camera would be brought to him. He'd get things set up. Sometimes the bottom got stirred up, so he'd have to wait for the uh, for everything to settle down and then shoot the three minutes of film, as he said, typically about five shots. That could take a couple of hours. Yeah, and, easily. Uh, sometimes it would be very short. He might get in the water and something be swimming by that he wanted to film, and he might be done in about 15 minutes. But usually. It was about three, about two hours, and each dive lasted 
about three hours, usually two dives a day, get in the water about nine in the morning, out at noon for lunch, very civilized, and then back in the afternoon for another three hours for the rebreather team. And, and um, uh, sometimes we would spend a lot more than that. I mean, so some of the, the animal behaviors we were looking for, we would just have to wait and wait. And uh, I think our longest dive was six and a half hours waiting for a, uh, stone a stonefish <laughs> to feed on something. So the rebreathers allowed us to do that and underwater communications allowed us to get the camera uh, loaded with film and our rebreather crew would just stay down on the bottom while the camera is being reloaded. And we typically make two or three dives a day, but they were very long dives. And you, some of you may recognize this uh, locale. We're in uh, South Australia here with the absolutely gorgeous uh, Australian sea lions. And we're gonna show a quick video of the, uh, of the sea lions here. Hopefully it'll play, okay. And there's some underwater communications. You'll hear uh, our crew talking to each other during this. coming in on your left. So if you remember that previous image where the sea lion was uh, right up close against the camera, you could see its reflection in the port, which is what was going on here. So the divers are talking to each other. I guess you're going to talk about uh, the water problem a little bit later. But the divers are talking to each other and uh, I happen to be in the water at this point, but uh, there would be somebody on the surface uh, on the boat who was monitoring the comms so they could hear what was being said. So they could hear what was being said as well, and they would know when to send the the recovery team down to bring the camera back for a film change. With the IMAX 3D camera, the distance between the subject and the camera was very critical. These animals are too close. They need to be three and a half feet away in order to get a good 3D image. So these, these guys aren't cooperating very much. There's a shot looking through the viewfinder, video viewfinder of the IMAX 3D camera. See Howard uh, and I guess that's Bob Cranston are walking the camera across the sea floor. They've taken their fins off. So they, uh, up. So they took their fins off so they can more easily uh, walk across and maneuver the camera. So that kind of brings us up to, to date with, with IMAX and how uh, we captured our IMAX films. Um, our at last IMAX film was released in 2009. Uh, 2009, and it was captured in 70 millimeter film. That was and, the 3D, our last 3D film. Uh, but things are changing, and, and uh, there's a whole image revolution going on with digital, as I'm sure a lot of you are uh, aware. And that has had huge consequences for making not only television films, but IMAX films. Uh, this is, again, the IMAX 2D camera system that weighs 100 kilos and runs for three minutes and costs... Uh, about $4,000, $3,000 every time you shoot three minutes. Uh, expensive, bulky, mechanical device. Uh, and requires not only the, the cost of film and processing and everything else, but the costs are to transport this, the size of the boats you need, the number of crew members that you need. And all of those things are very expensive because of the size of the gear that we're traveling with. And today... You can do similar work with a camera that looks like that. In fact, the truth of the matter is you can actually do better work with a digital camera that's about that size. And uh, for me, that's just, it's, it's mind boggling. Uh, early in my career, uh, all the films that I shot in 16 millimeter uh, wouldn't show well on a feature film screen and certainly not on an IMAX screen. And I remember dreaming of being able to afford a camera good enough to project 
an image on a feature film screen. Uh, I never imagined I'd be shooting IMAX films back in those days. But today, you can actually go out and buy a camera and sh shoot films that are uh, that will work on an IMAX screen for a fraction of the money that we spent on 16 millimeter cameras back in the 70s and 80s. So this is a, me with my digital camera. This is a, a red camera. Uh, and there's, there's been a, a variety of these. The first one was uh, the red one camera, which was 4K, the first 4K camera available back in 2010. Um, and then they moved to 6K. And now the most recent camera I've got is a, a red camera that will capture in 8K. That's 8,000 lines of resolution uh, horizontally across whereas uh, standard definition was 720 lines, uh, uh, HD was 1,920 lines, 4K is about almost 4,000 lines, and 8K is 8,000 lines of resolution. Uh, so that IMAX frame at the bottom there can be captured with a, with a digital camera in, in, in 8K, and 8K is actually, 8K digital is actually better than the 70 millimeter film that we used back in those days. So here's just kind of a rep rep representation of the different uh, modern formats, including HD, which is still around. Most of the stuff you watch on television is now HD, but it's slowly switching over to 4K. And, uh, and now we're beginning to capture in 8K. Now, what do you do with that 8K footage? One of the things you can do with it is special venue stuff like IMAX. Uh, that 8K image on an IMAX screen, as I said, looks better than, uh, than 70 millimeter film. And amazingly, you can actually go out and buy a phone that captures video in 8K today. Just think about that. <laughs> but when you look at a, a shot like this, and you see how close the audience is sitting to the screen. A film that, that you captured in, in 8K or even 4K uh, in 16 by 9, the standard composition you'd use for television, does not play well on an IMAX screen. Uh, the, there's different ways that you compose a film and edit a film depending on the format that you're showing it in. And... Uh, the IMAX screen is different than uh, watching a film on television or watching a feature film because the screen is very, very large. The aspect ratio is different. It's a four by three aspect ratio, essentially. And you sit very, very close to it. So you take an image like this, which would look fine on a television that you're in your home and would look fine on a feature film screen in a, in a theater it would look terrible in IMAX. And the reason is because, first of all, you have to crop the edges off. So the image would look more like this after you crop it to fit it on an IMAX screen because it's a four by three aspect ratio. That still looks okay, but the problem is that the IMAX screen is so big that the audience is really looking at this portion of it. The rest of the image is just negative space. So. If this image came up on an IMAX screen, you'd look at it and try to figure out what the heck you're looking at. You'd have to raise your head and look way, way up above you to see the, you know, the iguana's face and its eye. And you might not realize that that's what the director was hoping you would look at. So IMAX images are composed differently. Uh, this is an image that I shot uh, in 8K for our most recent IMAX film, which will actually be digital. But that's not the way it was captured. That's just an example. This is the way it was originally captured, and that's the way it will look in the IMAX theater. And that's not great composition for uh, television or uh, 35 millimeter, you know, production or even a, a digital still image. Uh, it's kind of like why did you, you know, not raise the camera a little bit and get the uh, the animal in the center. <laughs> But in IMAX, this is where you want the animal, in, that, in the bottom of the frame, uh, below the halfway mark, and this would be considered a close-up in IMAX. Here's another shot. This would be a close-up in IMAX. It's a little hard to believe, but it, it, that would leap out at you and be really, really big in the theater. 
So you have to be aware of the cons the uh, composition issues when you're working in special formats like IMAX. Uh, I have a, a lot of footage that I've captured in 8K in my library, uh, but for the film that we're making now, we're out shooting as much new stuff as possible so that we get the composition right because a lot of the stuff that I already have really won't work. Uh, so this is a, a, me with my 16 millimeter camera back in the uh, late 1980s. Um, and that's the format we captured seasons of the CN and so forth. And just to give you an idea of the difference in resolution, here's a comparison of the resolutions with standard definition being that little bitty frame below where it says full HD and then full HD, 4K and 8K. The amount of visual information uh, available in the new digital formats is just, it's just spectacular. Uh, here's an example of a shot, a frame grab from standard definition. This is a, 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 an image I captured for one of our films, Shadows in the Desert Sea. Uh, it's a frame grab from 16 millimeter transferred to standard definition videotape. Uh, doesn't look all that great as a still image, does it? Uh, HD was a big improvement. This is a shot captured in HD and a uh, frame grab, kind of a similar subject and much, much better, uh, four times the resolution of standard definition. And then this is an image captured in 8K. So you can see there's an enormous di difference in the images and the way the audience relates to these images is different. Uh, the visual Im information that's, that is presented stimulates that part of your brain that is looking at, you know, at, at the image. And uh, an image captured in standard definition just makes your, your brain kind of go to sleep. Whereas an image like this doesn't require as much music or narration because your brain is, you know, lit up by the spectacular colors and the, the detail that you see in the image. So... One question is, why would you want to bother? Why would you want to shoot in 8K? You can't, it's, it's difficult to go out and, and see 8K anywhere. Uh, your computers won't play 8K. Uh, you know, so why would you want to bother? Storage, hmm? storage problems. Well, yeah, the storage problem. There's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to bother. I mean, 8K images require a huge amount of digital storage, and uh, uh, they require extremely fast computers to, to play the 8K. Uh, this computer won't play 8K, and the computer I use for editing actually isn't fast enough to play 8K. I have to down convert to 4K or HD to be able to play it. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of disadvantages to it, and clients don't want it. Uh, clients don't want 8K because they don't want to have to store it. Uh, they're releasing on either HD or more recently in 4K. So why do they need an 8K image? Uh, they don't want it. And I heard all those same arguments when we switched from HD to 4K. Everybody was saying, well, we don't want the 4K because we can't store it, our computers won't play it. Well, now everybody is demanding 4K and a, a lot of the over-the-top venues are playing 4K on you know, Netflix and other streaming services. So 4K is here for sure. Uh, and everybody's now asking those questions about why should I bother with 8K? And I have a couple of, of reasons why I think that that's important. And it may not be so important if you're going out to, to make a, a, a movie about cops and robbers, you know, but when you go out to capture images of wildlife, uh, you may not get a second chance. Uh, things are disappearing on you know, from this planet at an amazing rate. A hundred species go extinct every day. Uh, it's just, it's just mind boggling. So when you capture an image, I feel like, at least I feel like I, I'm almost obligated to capture that image in the highest resolution possible because these animals may be gone tomorrow and these visual images may be the only reference we have uh, you know, in the future. That's a, a sad thing, but I feel like I want to capture these images in as high resolution now in case they're gone tomorrow. Some of these animals are, are you know, you, you might not see. A lot of the shots uh, that I captured for our early films, 
Seasons of the Sea and, and some of those others, you, you can't do now. They're, they're, uh, uh, the animals are gone. The behaviors are gone. Uh, the environment uh, that they lived in has been so degraded that, that capturing this, uh, the same image is just not possible anymore. So I would love to have some of the things that I filmed for Seasons of the Sea in 8K, uh, but it's just not possible. So another thing that's really interesting about the high resolution images, 4K and higher, and especially 8K, is that every frame of video in 8K is higher resolution than most professional digital still cameras, which is kind of mind boggling. So you can take a single frame out of uh, an 8K video and you can publish it on the cover of a magazine. That didn't exactly work the way I had in mind. I'll go back. So there's the, the shot, and that's the image captured out of a 4K camera. Here's a, a shot of a sailfish, a perfectly acceptable still. It's sharp. There's no noise in the image. Uh, you know, it's beautiful. It's captured right out of video. So I think that's exciting. And I started my career taking still photographs and, and writing for wildlife and dive magazines. And when I got into motion picture work, I kind of got away from doing stills. But I'm kind of back in it now because the first thing I do when I look at my 8K images is I go in there and pull out what I think are great stills to go in the still library. Another thing you can do, which is really cool, is since you're capturing in 8K and you're releasing in 4K, you can crop the image. In other words, you could take a shot like this and if you said, well, it would really be nice instead of showing one long scene of a white shark, if I could push in and, and grab a close up in the middle of that shot. Normally, when you're shooting a film, you would do that. But in 8K, you don't really always have to do that. You can just crop the image and it's still 4K resolution, even though you've cropped it by a factor of four, and it's still perfectly acceptable as a motion picture image. And here's another video just showing a, a scene of a uh, humpback whale that was captured in 8K, and they'll show um, a shot of it captured in 8K, and then they'll show the same shot cropped to 4K. So you get your cutaways. Hmm? So here we are. This is the crop version. It's still every bit as sharp and all the details there because you're only looking at it in 4K. I mean, you're actually not looking at it in 4K here, but on a 4K TV, you wouldn't be able to tell. Here's another example. You want a, a closer shot, you just push in and grab an, a 4K portion of the film. So you, you are a portion of the video. So. so that's one of the advantages of shooting in high resolution is that you can move around and crop the image. Uh, another thing that's really interesting about high resolution images is that there's all these special venues that are cropping up. We already talked about IMAX. You can now capture IMAX IMAX quality images with a phone. I mean, that just is absolutely mind boggling to me. Uh, of course, there's many different kinds of, of 8K images uh, as far as the different compressions and file types are concerned and the, the quality of the lens and uh, the quality of the compression uh, that renders the, the video. Those are all, those, that's highly variable. So I hope, <laughs> that the image quality you capture with your phone is probably not quite as good as the image I capture with my 8K camera. But I haven't really looked at the phones yet, so I, I'm not 100% sure that's true. But theoretically, you could go out and capture images with your phone and show it on an IMAX screen and it would look, look great. There's all kinds of other uh, special venues that are now come, becoming popular that really weren't possible with uh, HD or standard definition video. There's all these special venues that are showing up in exhibits and museums and theme parks that require super high resolution images. 
And we've been uh, capturing some of those special venues lately and working on them, which has been kind of a lot of fun. This is a, a video that we did for um, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is a mock-up, but it was a series of really huge uh, vertical uh, LCD screens. And uh, they, they formed a wall and just walked along the wall and played across all of these screens was one 8K image. And you could stand within about six feet of those monitors and you couldn't see any pixels or anything. It was just uh, razor sharp. Um, really beautiful images to work with. Another thing that's really been cool lately is that guys like Louis Sequoia have built huge projectors for projecting uh, wildlife images on structures. This is a shot uh, I did of an anemone fish in video. It's projected on the wall, uh, on the, the Vatican building. And uh, this is the way it was, this is what it looked like at the time. This was just taken with a, a, a cell phone when Louis was projecting the image. There's another shot of uh, uh, one of my shots projected on the Vatican. It looks like there's a screen actually erected there in front of the building, but it's not. It's just, it's just projected on the Vatican. There's been... Uh, uh, other people projected images on the Empire State Building and big buildings across the world. And it's a very cool way to, to, to show wildlife images. But maybe the biggest reason to, to you know, keep moving forward with the resolutions is that televisions are coming out that will be 8K. You can already go out and buy an 8K television. They're about $15,000, but by by this afternoon, they'll be down to $2,000, <laughs> and uh, uh, you can buy them. I don't think you can really get much in the way of 8K programming yet, but the way it works is that the, the TVs come out first, and then producers go out and start making uh, productions that are suitable to show on those TVs. So that's the way it was with 8K. When Sony, when Sony came out with their 4K uh, monitor uh, 10 years ago or so, uh, they asked me to make some videos for them because they had no 4K content. And so I made a whole series of short videos that were just wildlife videos uh, that played on the, the Sony 4K screen and were delivered for free to people that bought the 4K uh, television. And now the same thing is happening with 8K. You can go out and buy this. You have a hard time finding anything to play on it. But in a year or so, uh, there will be content available in 8K. By the way, the, the resolutions don't go you know, 1K, 2K, 3K, 4K. They increase by a factor of four. So the difference between standard definition and HD was a four times uh, image resolution increase. The image size was four times greater. And from uh, HD to 4K was another four times. And going from... 4K to 8K is, again, another factor of four. So the next iteration of televisions might be 16K. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but it wouldn't surprise me. So that's pretty much what we had to talk about. Uh, to kind of finish off the uh, our talk here, I thought I'd show the trailer for our most recent IMAX movie, which is tentatively called Secrets of the Sea. That will certainly change, but... Uh, uh, the film is almost done now. We've done all the editing. The images are being processed. And now we're just waiting for IMAX theaters to open back up, which might be a, a year or more. It's hard to say. But the film will be done when theaters open up again. And uh, this is just a, the trailer of the film, and I'll just play it here. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
secrets of the sea and will take you on your sea adventure. Exploring ocean ecosystems. Showing how biodiversity is critical to their survival. to an IMAX theater someday. <laughs> okay. uh, you'll, you'll notice that the composition for that was more for television than for IMAX. It's actually composed for IMAX, but when we uh, show a trailer like that on the web or in other venues, we, we crop it so that it's more 16 by 9. So. Uh, so since you're watching this, I know that you have access to Facebook. I mentioned that we have created a Facebook page for Secrets of the Sea, so you can uh, go to that and uh, hit follow and or like, and you'll receive updates uh, when we post something, which is not every day or every week, but we are trying to uh, keep people apprised of what's happening with the film. So... There's uh... That's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Howard and Michelle. That was that was absolutely spectacular footage, and um, like I just found it so interesting to to be able to see you know the behind the scenes of those massive cameras. Uh, like it's just mind blowing. <laughs> like that you can even handle that that sort of equipment. Um, so why don't we move on to maybe like five ten minutes of questions if if you know, our viewers had any questions before moving on to the, the film screening of Seasons of the Sea. Does that okay, sound good? You want, sure. Uh, I have them. I have the comments here that I'm looking at, which is why you see me keep looking off cool. here. But if, if you'd like to, if you've monitored them, Amelia, and you have some questions you want to toss out to us? Uh, no, I don't see any comments in the, uh, any questions in the comments right now. Do, do you have a different set? To no, what I'm looking I, at. I just, see, I just see comments, people saying thank it's you. It's just everyone saying hi. Hi, hi, hi Michelle. Hi, Howard. Hi us. So hi, everybody. <laughs> thank you for coming. And those of you on the West Coast for being here um, early with your cups of coffee, maybe. Um, thank you. I just see Jody Elliott saying, um, this is awesome. Thanks, Jody. Hi. <laughs> and Michelle. So anybody have any question you want to type quickly? Otherwise, uh, we'll probably let Amelia move on to showing Seasons of the Sea. Give it a second. Nope. Cool, fantastic. Let's, let's screen Seasons of the Sea then. Okay. Okay, Thank so you you've, both. You've, like, you've got that and you're going to play your... We um, will play that. So we'll play that separately okay. to... Okay, well, it's good see. talking to you. And thank you for for everything, and uh, we'll we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. Right. Bye. Hi, Big Hi, Marty. Bye. Hi, Ellen. Bye. Thank you, thank you, Howard and Michelle. See ya. Bye. Thanks, Elvin. Thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.